today we'll be discussing on anticholinergic drugs again this is very important uh, mostly atropin is asked as a short note and then uh, the uses of atropin derivatives have also been asked in previous questions so before we go into anticholinergics let's quickly revise the cholinergic receptors and its location how do we classify cholinergic receptors muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors muscarinic you have m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 m m4 m5 not much of a clinical role they are present in the cns where is m1 present on the gastric glands m2 in the heart and m3 elsewhere that is in the eyes in the glands and smooth muscles the bronchus git and bladder nicotinic receptors we divide them into nm and nn receptor nm is present on the neuromuscular junction nn is present on the autonomic ganglia okay and you all remember the cholinergic actions right from the eyes to the glands to the bronchus heart git bladder and blood vessels keeping that in mind we'll go to the anticholinergic drugs so anticholinergics are drugs which block the action of acetylcholine that are mediated through cholinergic receptors conventionally we uh, call them as parasympathetics or cholinergic blockers so basically the muscarinic blockers are what we call as anticholinergics the nicotinic blockers are called as either ganglion blockers or neuromuscular blockers the neuromuscular blockers Uh, we take it separately as skeletal muscle relaxants ganglion blockers not much of a role is there now uh, we are concentrating on the muscarinic blockers in class so muscarinic blockers are divided into the natural alkaloids and sympathetic and semi synthetic alkaloids the synthetic and semi synthetic drugs are classified based on the use into mitriatics anti secretory anti spasmodic agents the psycho selective agents and anti parkinsonian drugs when you are studying the classification remember at least two examples in each group okay so that is anti muscarinic drugs are commonly called as anti cholinergic drugs so we have natural alkaloids semi synthetic drugs synthetic drugs natural we have two drugs one is atropin the other one is hyoscine okay semi synthetic one we have homotropin that we use in the eye ipratropium thiotropium and synthetic ones we have uh, it is easy if you know the classification you will be able to remember the use also we have mitriatic agents that is cyclopentylate tropicamide we have anti secretory anti spasmodic agents we have glycopyrrolate pyrazinamine dicyclomin oxyphenonium we have anti parkinsonian drugs like trihexyphenidin and benzhexol vesico selective agents like oxybutynin tolterodin clavoxate etc so this is how we classify the uh, anti muscarinic agents how do we classify natural agents semi synthetic synthetic okay it's uh, it's of no harm if you combine uh, semi synthetic and synthetic together so instead of this mitriatic anti parkinson some vesico selective anti secretory anti spasmodic you can add bronchodilators also and under that you come ipratropium thiotropium natural you have hyoscine and atropin and then the anti nicotinic drugs we have ganglion blockers that is uh, blocking the nn receptors and we have the neuromuscular blockers that is nm receptors so ganglion blockers we have hexamethonium mecalamine and trimethorphan we don't use these uh, these drugs these days earlier we used to use trimethorphan for hypertensive emergencies and all but now we don't use neuromuscular blockers is the skeletal muscle relaxants we divide them as non depolarizing blockers and depolarizing blockers that itself is a separate chapter so this class will be discussing on the anti muscarinic blockers so anti muscarinic agents the natural ones are hyoscine and atropin because they are derived from the plant sources okay hyoscine the other name for hyoscine is scopolamine they are non selective competitive blockers of muscarinic receptor non selective means they block all subtypes m1 m2 m3 receptors and they are competitive blockers they compete with uh, acetylcholine for the receptor site now atropin is derived from atropa belladonna and hyoscine is derived from hyoscyamus nigra 
there is a brief uh, interesting history behind the naming of the Atropa belladonna. It was named by Carl Linnaeus as the Atropa belladonna. It's otherwise commonly known as the deadly nightshade. The reason being this plant, the, uh, the berries of this plant was used in earlier days for chronic poisoning or slow poisoning. And you can see here that it is a Greek goddess named Atropos who cuts, you can see she's cutting uh, the thread with a scissor. They suppose that it is a thread of life and she decides when a person will die. Since uh, atropin is used as a poison, Carl Linnaeus named it as atropa. Atropa from atropos. Okay. And why belladonna? Belladonna is an Italian word that means beautiful. It was uh, uh, said that in earlier days, Cleopatra and all was used this uh, uh, atropin berry. Atropa berry to dilate the eyes to look more alluring or beautiful. So that is how this name Atropa belladonna came. Okay. Now, what are the actions of atropin? So, right from CNS, what does it do? It causes CNS stimulation. Okay. It stimulates the vagal, respiratory, and vasomotor centers. At higher concentration, it can result in convulsions, disorientation. That we call it as atropin psychosis. In case of atropin toxicity, the patient will get psychosis. Various types of hallucinations can be there. And it can stimulate the uh, temperature regulating center and can cause rise in temperature. That is not the only reason since it is anticholinergic. Cholinergic system will stimulate the M3 receptors, causes the glands to secrete. Anticholinergic will decrease all the secretions. So, decrease of sweating will also result in rise in temperature. So this is known as atropin fever. This is more common in children. Children are more susceptible. Other than this, in CNS, uh, in the basal ganglia, when the cholinergic action is suppressed, it has got anti-Parkinsonian action. And the vestibular transmission, in case of vomiting in motion sickness, because of suppression of these vest vestibular excitation, it is useful. Anticholinergic drugs are useful in motion sickness. Especially high use we use it in motion sickness. Now, what about CVS? Think about the cholinergic action. M2 receptor decrease in heart rate. So, anticholinergic increase heart rate, increase AV conduction. Okay, because of M2 blockage, so it results in tachycardia. Okay, atropin will result in tachycardia. And regarding BP, as I told earlier, cholinergic blood vessels do not have a direct cholinergic innervation, but through nitric oxide, it causes vasodilatation. In some places, the uh, it has direct uh, vaso direct innervation on the blood vessels. That is on the skin and uh, skin of the face and neck. It has got direct innervation. So there, by blocking these uh, cholinergic receptors, it causes vasodilatation. So it causes blushing. That is known as atropin flush. Now, what about the smooth muscles? Cholinergic system, everywhere it causes contraction. So, anticholinergic will cause relaxation by acting on the M3 receptor. So, GIT, it causes decreased peristalsis that can result in um, constipation. Bronchus, it causes bronchodilatation that helps in uh, improving the symptoms in case of COPD patients. What about bladder? It causes relaxation of the detrusor muscle. That helps in retaining the urine or causes urinary retention. So GIT, it can cause constipation. It causes a relaxation of the biliary tract and bladder. So we give it in different types of colicky pains also. Urinary tract, it, uh, it causes urinary retention. Respiratory system, it causes bronchodilatation. And what about the glands? It decreases all the secretions. So decreases the salivary uh, sweat, bronchial, lacrimal and gastric secretions by production is not affected. Because of this decreased secretion, we use it as a pre-anesthetic medication to prevent the aspiration pneumonia and all. Now, what is its action? The eye, eye what does a cholinergic drug do? It causes meiosis. So, what does uh, anticholinergic drug do? It causes midriasis or dilatation. How does it produce dilatation? By relaxation of the sphincter pupillae muscle. 
it not only causes metriasis, there are about seven actions of atropin or anticholinergic agents in the eye. The first one is it causes metriasis. We'll see in the next slide what is active metriasis and what is passive metriasis. Then it causes abolition of light reflex. Because light reflex is when you uh, uh, sh uh, shine a torch in your eyes, the light reflex goes and it contracts the sphincter pupillae to cause constriction of the pupil. So when the sphincter pupillae is paralyzed, the light reflex gets abolished. Okay. It causes cycloplegia. What is cycloplegia? It causes paralysis of the ciliary muscle because M M3 receptor is present in the ciliary muscle also. It causes paralysis of the ciliary muscle. And because it is uh, the eyes are kept dilated and there is uh, abolition of light reflex, it can cause photophobia, dryness of eyes because lactamyl gland is inhibited. And in case if there is a narrow iridocorneal angle, it can, the dilatation can suddenly go and clo close this iridocorneal angle and can increase the intraocular pressure. Now we have seen this already. There is a circular muscle and there is a radial muscle. The circular muscle is innervated by the cholinergic uh, system and the dilator muscle is innervated by the sympathetic system. So, on the dilator muscle, we have this alpha 1 receptor. On the sphincter pupillae, we have the M3 receptors. So, how does metriasis happen? Either when there is relaxation of the sphincter pupillae. How does this relaxation of sphincter pupillae happen? Because sphincter pupillae has M3 receptors. So, relaxation means M3 has to be blocked. That is by anticholinergic drugs. And how does this contraction of dilator pupillae happen? Contraction will also result in metriasis. So, dilated pupillae is by alpha 1. So, by adrenergic agonist like phenylephrine can cause metriasis. So, among those which will be active metriasis, which will be passive metriasis. Active means there is active contraction of something. So, phenylephrine causes active metriasis and atropin causes passive metriasis. What is the other difference between them? Atropin in addition also produces cycloplegia and it can sometimes increase the intraocular pressure. Whereas phenylephrine or in active metriasis, there is no cycloplegia because ciliary muscle is not affected and it decreases the intraocular pressure. Because it's an alpha agonist, it causes vasoconstriction of the ciliary blood vessels and that can reduce the intraocular pressure. Now, what is the difference between, so these are the pharmacological actions of atropin. So, we have seen in the CNS, then in the bronchus, GIT, bladder, in the eyes, in the glands, what are the actions of atropin? Okay. Now, what is the difference between atropin and hyosin? Both are natural agents. Atropin is derived from atropa belladonna and hyosin from hyosinus niger. Atropin is a CNS stimulant and hyosin is a CNS depressant. That is a main uh, difference that you should remember. Atropin is longer acting and hyosin is shorter acting. So, where do we use atropin and where do we use hyosin? Hyosin mainly we use it for motion sickness because it depresses the vestibular excitation. We can use it as a transdermal patch behind the pinna. It can be kept uh, for up to three days. The duration of action is about three days. And it is also used as a lie detector drug or the truth serum. Okay. Atropin, uh, one indication we have already seen in the last class that is it's a drug of choice for OP poisoning or the organ of muscles poisoning. Then it increases the heart rate. So it is a cardiac vagolytic agent. So in case of uh, severe bradycardia to counteract the heart block we may give atropin. We give it for OP poisoning and certain types of mushroom poisoning like inocyte species mushroom poisoning. Then we give it along with neostigmin for myasthenia gravis because neostigmin is a cholinergic drug. It's indirectly acting cholinergic drug. So here we mainly need in myasthenia gravis it, uh, we, in order to counteract the muscarinic side effects we give uh, atropin along with neostigmin. Uh, also in cobra bite also mainly we need uh, this neostigmine to increase acetylcholine to go and act on the N receptors 
stimulate the skeletal muscle contraction. But that will also go and bind to M3 receptors or other muscarinic receptors and can bring about side effects. To counteract that, you add a tropin to neostigmin in treatment of myasthenia gravis as well as in case of cognomite. This is the same principle why we add it with diphenoxalate. Diphenoxalate is the uh, anti-motility drug that is an opioid derivative that has abuse potential. So you combine it with atropin. Atropin because it is anti-secretory and other side effects that is discomforting to the patient. It is less chance that patient uh, will abuse this particular drug. For that reason, we combine it with diphenoxalate which is an anti-motility agent. Now we come to atropin substitute. So if atropin itself is asked as a short note, what you have to write is, it's an anticholinergic, it's a natural uh, substitute, natural alkaloid. It is a competitive blocker, non-selective blocker of muscarinic receptors. Then you write the pharmacological action, uses adverse effects I'll tell in the end, but that also you should write uh, regarding atropin. Okay, now we come to atropin substitute. So I have included the semi-synthetic agents also under this atropin substitutes. So if you remember the classification, it is based on their use. Okay, so you just need to know examples and why it is used in that particular condition. So we have uh, midriatics, anti-secretory, anti-spasmodic, psychoselective, anti-Parkinsonian drugs. What are the midriatics that uh, is being used, atropin derivatives. So we have homatropin, cyclopendylate, tropicamide and atropin. The problem with atropin is it is very long acting. It, the duration of action is in the eye is about 7 days. So it is not uh, proper to make a patient visually handicapped up to 7 days. So we use shorter alternative midriatics in adults. So it causes midriasis and cycloplegia. What are the uses of uh, midriatics? We use it for diagnostic purpose, that is for testing refractory errors, as well as for visualizing the fundus in case of diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy. In order to visualize the fundus, to dilate it, we use these agents. For therapeutic purpose, we use in case of iritis or uveitis, where there is inflammation of the iris. And this exudates can uh, bring about adhesions between the lens and the iris. So to break the adhesions or prevent the adhesions, we alternatively use a mitriatic with um, a myotic like pilocarpin uh, to break these adhesions and also to give a rest to the ciliary muscle. So these are the different mitriatics that we use in the eye. You can see here, atropin has a duration of 7 to 10 days. Which is the shortest acting among this? It is tropicamide, that is 3 to 6 hours, because of which we prefer that in adults. Atropin still we use as a mitriatic in children, because in children, when you are looking at refractory errors, when you are checking for refractory errors, it is important that we have a drug with good cycloplegic effect. For that, we may use atropin as a mitriatic in children. Okay. Now coming to bronchodilators, we have iprotropium, thiotropium. They act on the uh, M3 receptors, block it and causes bronchodilatation. Do not affect the mucociliary clearance or tracheobronchial secretions much. They have more use in COPD than asthma and it is preferred that you give it by inhalation route because it is directly reaching the site of action, less dose, less side effects. Okay. Now we come to anti-Parkinsonian drugs. So we have central anticholinergic drugs like trihexyphenidyl, benzpyridin or benztropin. They decrease the cholinergic overactivity in basal ganglia. So you can see normally in basal ganglia there is a balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. What happens in Parkinsonism? This balance is distorted. There is decreased dopamine or there is an increased acetylcholine. Okay. So normally in Parkinsonism what does we do? We give this dopamine substitutes oh, like levodopa or dopamine precursors um, like bromocryptin or ropinerol. Different agents are there that, that can increase the dopamine levels. But if certain drugs can induce Parkinsonism like haloperidol. Haloperidol is an antipsychotic agent. It acts by blocking the D2 receptors. 
okay so that on long term administration can also result in parkinsonism so in such cases even if you give liver dopa it will be of no use because the d2 receptors are already blocked so in such case what do you do you target the other pathogenesis that is cholinergic overactivity so to block that you give an agent that can cross the blood brain barrier has got central anticholinergic action and that is your trihexyphenidyl or benzhexone okay so this is what was told when we give a, a drug like haloperidol phenothiazin or metoclopramide which is a anti emetic agent the d2 receptors are blocked so even if you give dopamine it will not be able to come and bind to the receptors so you target the other mechanism that is reduce the cholinergic overactivity now coming to the anti secretory and the spasmodic action anti secretory it's very clear m3 receptors are blocked it reduces the secretion of your lacrimal gland gastric gland bronchial uh, glands the bronchial uh, smooth muscles so we use in case of peptic ulcer pyrenzepin telenzepin are the drugs but rarely we use we have better agents now for peptic ulcer as a pre anesthetic agent still uh, it is very uh, useful glycopyrrolate is preferred over etropin because glycopyrrolate has less cns um, side effects compared with etropin why we are using these agents as pre anesthetic agents because it reduces secretion prevent the laryngeal spasm reduce the chance of aspiration pneumonia as well as prevent the vagal bradycardia that can happen during surgery among etropin and uh, glycopyrrolate we prefer glycopyrrolate because it does not cross a blood brain barrier lack central side effects less tachycardia compared with etropin then we have anti spasmodic agents that reduces the spasm of the muscles like dicyclobin propranthalin oxyphenonium and all we give it for intestinal colic renal colic biliary colic uh, menstrual or dysmenorrhea that is uterine colic we give these are the spasmodic agents valetamate is used for dilatation of cervix now what are these vesico selective drugs vesico selective drugs vesico means bladder they are selective for bladder okay so you have drugs like oxybutynin tolterodin flavoxate darifenacin so what they do they relax these detrusa muscles they help in uh, retaining the bladder capacity so we give it in conditions where there is a neurogenic bladder and there is detrusa instability and sometimes we may use it for nocturnal aneurysms there is bed wetting in children more than 7 years so how will you remember these uh, vesico selective drugs you can remember by mnemonic soft bladder soft means relaxed bladder okay s for solifenacin it is the longest acting agent o for oxybutynin it's the shortest acting f for flavoxate t for tolterodin bladder dar for dari penacid among this the tropcm has minimum cns penetration so less cognitive impairment so these are the drugs that we use for neurogenic bladder other than this we use mirabegron which is a newer beta 3 agonist okay that sometimes may be asked for your pg mcq so that is about the uh, atropin derivatives and its uses so you need to know the classification where uh, these agents are used atropin derivatives are used and what is the rationale behind uh, their use in that particular condition now what about the adverse effects and toxicity again it's an extension of the pharmacological action what will the patient have drug uh, overdose or it could be a consumption of these seeds and berries by the children dry mouth because all the secretions are reduced there is difficulty in swallowing and talking there can be constipation urinary retention nidriasis blurring of vision photophobia tachycardia palpitation flushing hypotension and cns it can cause stimulation and psychosis hallucinations convulsions and finally coma and if not treated can result in death so there is a mnemonic to remember these uh, symptoms we say it as dry as a bone because all the secretions are dried up okay blind as a bat because of photophobia and blurring uh, it becomes the person becomes blind as a bat 
red as a beet because as i told earlier there is some uh, cutaneous direct innovation for cholinergic uh, innovation in the uh, blood vessels of the skin and the face when that is blocked that can result in vasodilatation so red as a beet hot as a hair that is there is rise in temperature because one is reduction of uh, sweating and also it stimulates the respiratory the temperature regulating center mad as a wet hen the hen is wet it, 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 it we say it as a mad as a wet hen or mad as a mad hatter so that is because of cns psychosis atropin psychosis what will be the treatment again any poisoning you give supportive management and definitive treatment supportive you keep in a quiet dark room cold sponging to reduce the temperature maintain fluid maintain respiration do gastric lavage with tannic acid definitive you give a cholinergic agent and you prefer physostigmin why not neostigmin because physostigmin can counteract the central effects of atropin because it can cross the uh, blood brain barrier now what are the contraindications for atropin narrow irrocorneal angle if you give atropin because of the sudden dilatation it can clo close this angle between the iris and the cornea that can precipitate acute angle closure glaucoma and in elderly male with prostatic hypertrophy if you give atropin it can suddenly result in um, urinary retention so these are the main contraindications for atropin okay just a word on ganglionic stimulants not much of a use nicotinin no therapeutic use is there varaniclin is a partial agonist at nicotinic receptors we use it for smoking cessation because it reduces the nicotine craving and reduces the withdrawal symptoms but the problem with varaniclin is it has got a black box warning because there is increased chance for suicidal tendency so what are the drugs that we give for tobacco smoking one is you can give nicotine replacement as tablets or as transdermal patch or chewing gum varaniclin is another drug which is a partial agonist so that will decrease the craving or the reward pathway is getting blocked okay so the patient won't get the happiness of smoking and the other reason that we give is bupropion which reduces the reuptake of uh, dopamine and noradrenaline again the reward pathway is getting blocked and less side effects now certain drugs have got anticholinergic property like antidepressants tricyclic antidepressants then uh, like imipramine antipsychotics like typical antipsychotics like haloperidol antihistamines with anticholinergic action like diphen hydramin so all these drug poisoning also your treatment becomes isostigmine which is having cholinergic action okay so that is about anticholinergic drugs we should know in detail about atropin atropin substitutes what are the uses of atropin substitutes hope it is clear thank you for listening